we are looking at the neoclassical period, taking a bird's eye view on the period, in order to understand its character, its zeitgeist, its, the spirit of the age. And then we will then return to the restoration period and with its literature account for the themes and style of the literature of the time. So to understand the term neoclassical, you need to take the part. Second part, you need to consider it in terms of in terms of its constant morphemes, which are new and classical. New and classical. So you need to understand that new means new. And so this means new classical here. Means that we had a classical period before, and now we have an age that's the neoclassical. Remember that the classical period was in the fifth and fourth century BC. The Greco-Roman period or era of the 5th and 4th century BC constitutes uh, the classical period. Right now we are talking about the times of the uh, Greeks and the Romans, the period of Aristotle and Plato, the time when Homer, Virgil, lived and books in literature, and the philosophers of Aristotle and Plato, and the Plurites uh, were Sophocles, Aeschylus and Alice. Okay? Now, another period in human history that reminded us about the, class, the classical period was the Renaissance in the 14th century this, uh, AD. When the philosophers and the writers of the time looked to the classical period, for inspiration, or studied the class, classical works and modeled their works after them. Study classical texts and language and style, borrowed from classical uh, classical writers and philosophers, and use them as a model to inspire the literature and arts. Now, after the Renaissance. Another period that reminds the classical period is the new classical period of the 18th century. And remember that the 18th century begins at 1700. But because we are studying the entire period of English literature from the Middle Ages, to the Victorian period. It's important to also, for us to also consider the Restoration period because there's something that the Restoration period tells us about the neoclassical period because the character of the Restoration period gave us a sort of enablement for the neoclassical period and its literature, the flourishing of its literature. That's what we're trying to say all this while. So this is how you understand the new classical period. This is a new classical period. And it existed in the 18th century English history. So it means like the classical. That's what it means. Like the classical. The new classical period means like the classical. As it means after the classical, after the classical, a 
after the class. It also means following the class code. Following the class code. Following the class. Meaning that in order to understand the character of the age that we're talking about in the 18th century, you need to have some knowledge about the classical period, which is why I insisted at a point that we must include classical period in the study of English literature. Because without that, the student will not have the comprehensive knowledge of how things began. Of course, in Western history, in Western philosophy, Western epistemology, we have to trace our knowledge back to classical, to the classical period, right? But when we are talking about African epistemology, our knowledge does not start with the classical period. Our knowledge starts with African civilization, which dates further back compared to the classical period. So it was not the Greeks and the Romans who taught us. We in Africa taught the Greeks and the Romans. And that is the truth. Right? But for purposes of our understanding, this course, in this course, we need to accept the assumption that the classical period was the origin of knowledge in Western metaphysics, in Western literature, in philosophy. But the truth is that we were not taught, Africans were not taught by the Greeks and the Romans. They actually came to Africa to learn from us. And that is the truth. So, Writers and philosophers in the 18th century, English history and literature, looked to the classical period for models for inspiration as well. And that's why the age is called classical, the neoclassical period. That's why the age is called neoclassical period. So the neoclassical period is so called because it resembles in character, in zeitgeist, the time of the Greek and Romans. Apart from that, the writers of this time also looked to the ancient writers for inspiration. So that is why it's called the neoclassical period. Now the neoclassical period goes by many epithets. Neoclassical period goes by many epithets. The neoclassical period goes by many epithets. One of them is the Augustan period. The Augustan period. So sometimes you may not hear the neoclassical period, but you can hear Augustan period. Augustan period. It is so called because the 18th century thinkers and philosophers thought that the age had semblance to the age or to the time of Augustus Caesar in the first century AD. At that time, that period resembled the time of Augustus Caesar in the first century AD. And that's why they call it Augustan age. Now, the, the semblance is seen in these two parameters. 
the semblance to sin these two parameters. One is that the people of Rome had just emerged from a prolonged civil war. Just as the, the English people had emerged from a prolonged civil war. The people of Rome enjoyed a long period of peace after them, and the English people also enjoyed a long period of peace with Charles II. And the Pope. There was flourishing of literature and art during this time in Rome, just in the time of Augustus Caesar, just as there is the flourishing of literature and art in the English period of the time that we are talking about. So that is the semblance. And so when the English people looked at that and they said, okay, let us go for our like age, the Augustan age, because it resembles the period of Augustus Caesar, the first century AD. That's the reason that it is so called. Apart from the, the other reasons I gave, for instance, about them looking to the ancient writers for inspiration and for models, you want to write their work. Is that important? It's not a that you understand that. The new classical period is also known as the Age of Enlightenment. The Age of Enlightenment. Now that it detects, the period goes by is is the Age of Enlightenment. The Age of Enlightenment. Remember that an epithet, an epithet is a descriptive expression. It's an adjective and it's qualified. Because that's what adjectives do. They qualify. Wonderful. So whenever you hear epithet, you know that it's a descriptive word. It gives more meaning when it's written about that which it qualifies. And so forth. So, another that means it is the age of knowledge. It's the age of what? Knowledge. knowledge. It is the age of knowledge. So, being the age of knowledge, the age of enlightenment, means that. The neoclassical period experienced an explosion in knowledge and discoveries about the world around man and about man's self. Okay? So, for instance, the, the voyages in the discovery of land that began in the 15th century, that 15th century continued at this time and yielded more fruits And the English people were able to expand their territories into other parts of the world, including the Americas, the Caribbean, and Africa, Asia, like India, and so on and so forth. There was increase in the number of people who were getting education. There was increase in the number of people who
who were getting educated. Because of the gradual decentralization of the education system. More and more people were getting educated. Education was no longer the freezer of certain classes of people. If you could afford education, you could be educated. And now, at this point in history, wealth was no longer circulating among uh, the queens and the kings alone. Any common person who is willing to take risk could become wealthy. And that was when the middle class was the middle Anyone was willing to take risk and work hard in that world, it was possible for the person to have some means. And with the means, the person could be educated, could afford education. Because you see, there were opportunities outside England. Because if you went to the New World, for instance, world was out there. You could, you could have traders. You could engage in plantation business. You could sell slaves. You could do these trades and make a lot of money, even though you were not of the upper class. And with that money, means that you get into the middle class, your children could afford education. And come back to England and buy property. So things were changing. The class division was not strict anymore. People could, because they were able to stumble on wealth, could change their class and circumstances. And so that's why people who could not afford education before now were able to afford education. And children of middle class who could be educated. Apart from that, apart from that, the, decentral the decentralization of the education system meant that all the individual needed to do in order to know how to be educated is to know how to read and write. Once one knew how to read and write, one could educate himself through studies. And the existence of the mobile library meant that books could get into the countryside and the remote villages. You could stay in your village and you see books passing by in a truck and you could borrow and read and better yourself. So that's why I said that more and more people were getting educated. So at this time too, because of the explosion of knowledge, you had many philosophies. Uh, many philosophies. Philosophies and philosophies and counter philosophies. One of such philosophies was empiricism. The other was rationalism. Enlightenment means that knowledge is celebrated. Intellectualism is celebrated. People propose views and counter views on how society 
should be. And one of such philosophies will be rationalism, the other will be what? Empiricism. Empiricism. Rationalism were two opposing philosophies in the Enlightenment period, the Enlightenment age. For instance, empiricism is rooted in science and scientific principles. Rhythm is rooted in science and scientific principles. And it believes that knowledge is gained through the use of experiment and the use of sense experience. Knowledge can only be gained through what? Experiments and what? The use of sense experience. Use of sense experience. So in present, it's rooted in the scientific methods. And it advocates the use of the senses, the five senses, in determining what is real, what is truth, what is knowledge, what is knowable, as well as a scientific experiment. Meaning that it's a well, the experiment has to be a well let down procedure, has to, be, has to follow a well let down procedure. Outside this, there's no knowledge. Outside this, there's no knowledge. So for the empiricists, for the empiricists, those who believe in, in empiricism, or empiricists. Something is real when you can see it, can touch it, can feel it. You can hear it, you can test it. That means you use the five senses to determine that it is real. Otherwise, it is not real. So that's why we also call the neoclassical period the scientific age. That's why we also call the neoclassical period the scientific age because of its reliance on scientific knowledge for the determination of truth and reality, or determination of knowledge. All right? This is of the scientific method to determine knowledge, truth and reality. The rationalists believe that knowledge is based on the use of reason and logic. The rationalists believe that knowledge is based on the use of reason and logic. That reality is in the mind. We believe that reality is in the mind. 
believe that reality is in the mind. So suppose and you've heard of the expression, what is conceivable and believable is achievable in life. Suppose you've heard of the expression, right? What is conceivable and believable is achievable in life. That is the rationalist method. Okay? Because they believe that reality is first of all what the mind can see. And not necessarily what we see around us. But whatever we see around us is a conception of the mind. That's the first existence in the mind. If the mind entertains it, then it is possible. I imagine. Because it relies on the power of the human mind to transform our realities. You have to transform the realities in the world begin to be your ability to conceive that transformation in the mind. That's where it begins. And then you also believe that that is possible. Your pastor teaches you this all the time. Okay? You have to see it, you have to believe it, and then it will come to pass. So as you can see, these two philosophies of are opposed to each other. These two philosophies are opposed to each other. But they help us form the Enlightenment philosophy, especially rationality, that is rooted in logic and reason. Because when you want to describe the Enlightenment age, to describe the Enlightenment age, you should describe the Enlightenment age as the age of reason. As the age of what? The age of reason. As another epithet of the neoclassical period goes by. As another epithet of the neoclassical period goes by. The age of reason. The age of reason arises from the use of the rationalist method in determining reality. I need to remind you that this course is deeply philosophical, and so if you have to enjoy this class, you have to reach your level of understanding isms. Right? Good. You have to raise your level of understanding the many isms that were mentioned in this course. You have to be a lover of philosophy because you cannot enjoy literature without philosophies. Literature's uh, philosophies make literature interesting. Right? Okay. So the neoclassical period celebrates human reason, the ability for human beings to think and be different from the other animals, other creatures of God. There's this reason that makes man a higher animal. Besides that, man is an animal. It's like goats, like sheep, like elephants, like tortoises, like cows. But because reason comes in, makes man different from the rest of the world. Reason holds the key to understanding the concept of enlightenment age. That reason is rooted in the philosophy of rationalism. So rationalism is the belief that all behavior, opinions and so on, should be based on reason rather than emotions or religious beliefs. 
So you could see that at this point, humanity were gradually moving away from religion and religious faith. And the crisis will get to our head when we get to the Victorian period. But in the Victorian period, the crisis erupted. And we could already see the instability in religious faith, how science destabilizes religious faith. Same with empiricism. He says, if you cannot see it, don't believe that it exists, including the existence of God. If you cannot see it, it does not exist. If you cannot touch it, it does not exist. Perhaps, maybe Thomas was an empiricist, because he has to touch where the spear, where the nails went through. Oh, and the side where the spear went through. Right? Because an empiricist wants to touch to believe that it exists. And that's the scientific method. Okay? In empiricism, human knowledge comes mostly from experiences made possible by the five senses. So if you come and tell somebody there is God, the person will ask you, where is he? The empiricist. A staunch empiricist. A thoroughgoing empiricist. A die-hard empiricist will ask you, where is he? Okay? Can I see him? Because when I see him, I will believe that he exists. Can I touch him, like Thomas? And when you say you can, just believe so you know it's not possible. God does not exist. Right? Because knowledge comes from what? Experiences made possible by what? The five senses. Sight, hearing, test, touch, and so on and so forth. For rationalism, knowledge is based on the use of reason and logic, which is why in literature of this time, we doubt man's reason by the nature of his actions. When we look at your actions and we don't see reason there, we doubt your Humanity, whether you are, you can't understand whether you are a human being at all. So, who were the empiricists of this time? Who were the empiricists of this time? Number one, the chief among them, the chief of them all, was David Hume. You must have heard David Hume. Huh? Yes. Okay, David Hume. Was a die hard empiricist. It's a die hard We will not agree for anyone. Understand? We will not agree for anyone. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Then you have John Locke. You have heard of John Locke, right? And that stands in first. John Locke. Okay? And then we have Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell. We also have George Berkeley. So David Hume once said, if we take in our hand any volume of divinity or school metaphysics, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? No. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence? No. Commit it then to the flames. For it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. That's what David Hume said. 
If it is not scientific, forget it. It does not exist. Finally, that knowledge is not good for the back of that sense. Okay? The rationalists include the manual of patents. The manual of patents. Is rationalism. My own Kant. Baro Spinoza. And remember this cartis. Classical theory is also the aim of science. This is because of the this is because of the scientific discoveries of the time and the scientific philosophies that regulated. So because of the over 18th belief in science and scientific principles, because of the over 18th belief in science and scientific principles, the neoclassical period was marked by order. In Western, meaning that it was highly regulated, meaning that it was highly regulated, regulated. By that, it is meant that there were rules to guide every aspect of human life. Let's write that down. The new class book here had rules to regulate and guide every aspect of human relations, including social relations. And you dare not break those rules. Because people tended to behave like machines because of this overlying on rules. People's lives became more or less mechanical. So life, people's lives became more or less mechanical because of overlying on rules and regulations. So they were machine-like in behavior. They were machine-like in behavior. And it could result, it could result in a stream whereby people live artificial or fake life. It result in a situation whereby people live artificial of fake life. Meaning that they were not real, they were not genuine. 
because they were simply following existing social rules. So you had to know whereby people could smile when they were supposed to cry. Okay? Within them, they know that tears, supposed, tears are supposed to burst out. But the rule says at this moment you're supposed to smile. And so they have no choice and they smile. Okay? At that point. So they were not living the new and this is the kind of lifestyle that was satirized in the literature of the time. Because the writers of that time saw that the people of the time lived pretentious lives. The people of the time lived pretentious lifestyle. Simply following social dictates and rules, not living based on um, what is actually going on in that life. Okay, so if you have to smile when you're, when you're supposed to cry, then we wonder how that smile will look like. Perhaps you smile like a crocodile. Smile will look like the smile of a crocodile. Right? Which is what we call the suffering and smile. Okay. So please note that this kind of behavior resulted in people living artificial life, fake life. Not showing their emotion. Because they were living based on reason. Not showing their emotion. Right? And remember that it is this kind of lifestyle that is satirized by the writers of the time. But the writers looked at the people living in that time and said, what what was all this? People are not being real. So now they decided to satirize the, 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 the kind of behavior. But they love that kind of writers do that and a lot. They are very really lot. The things are happening on the side and they write about it. And so that is why the neoclassical period is also called the age of satire. Also called what? The age, age of satire. The classical period is also called the age of satire. In fact, the dominant literary mood of the time is what? Satire. Whenever you think of neoclassical literature, what do you what should come to your mind to what? To this attack. So that is the dominant literary move of the time. Sata. Neoclassical. Another epithet the neoclassical the neoclassical period goes by is that it is the age of Sata. So what is Sata? What is Sata? Sata refers to a work of art. Ridicules human foibles in order to correct them. Ridicules human foibles in order to correct them. Such a laugh at human weakness. In order to correct them. So, Sata. Is she remembered is the dominant literary mode of the time. The literature of this time was mostly satiric in tone because it aimed to mock the excesses of the people of this time who, in the cause of following social rules, made a mockery of themselves. Because they needed to follow social rules, they made um, fools of themselves. Okay? They, they overdid it. Okay? 
So the like the writers will say within the Nawa or some people will do it. That's what the writers will say within the Nawa. Okay. So in talking about satire, we have two two categories. Two categories. Two main types. We have the direct satire, we have the indirect satire. We have the direct satire, we have the indirect satire. Remember that till today satire remains a powerful weapon in literature and in criticism. It's a form of comedy. It aims to correct, to change behavior through laughter. It is, it is based on the idea that we can laugh at our mistakes and then correct ourselves. We can laugh at our mistakes and then correct ourselves. Okay? So, in the direct satire, the direct, direct satire, the persona speaks in the first person. The persona speaks in the first person. Using I. Using what? I. Using I. Okay. Okay. The first person narrator uses I to address the audience in a direct satire. You don't call it direct satire, you also call it formal satire. You call it formal satire. So if you don't call it direct satire, call it formal satire. It makes use of the first person uh, pronoun as used by the narrator to address the audience. It uses her eye. This narrator is also known as the adversaries. The adversaries. Known as the adversaries. Adversaries. So there are two types of formal satire. There are two types of formal satire. Formal or direct satire. One is Horatian satire. One is Horatian satire. Horatian satire. And the other is Juvenalian satire. Juvenalian satire. Juvenalian satire. Let's look at Horatian satire. Horatian satire is mild on the victim with the intent to make them laugh at their foolish and then correct themselves. One distinctive attribute of the Horatian satire is that it is sucked on its target. Okay? It is not intended to finish the target. Alright? <laughs> Alright? It's not aimed to finish the target. It is sucked. It is mild on the target. It's not meant to finish them. Okay. The intention is for them to love and then correct themselves. So in this type of satire, the narrator is tolerant. The narrator is what? Tolerant. The narrator is also witty. The narrator is tolerant. Witty and a bang. Tolerance, witty and a bang. Uh, 
A bend in the sense in the sense that he's enlightened, he's educated, he's exposed. Okay. So we will read Alexander Pope's The Rape of the Lock as a Horatian satire. It's a Horatian satire. We're going to read Alexander Pope's The Rape of the Lock, let's end the course, as what? It's an example of Horatian satire. When we read it, you could see that the Pope is mild on the target of the satire. He simply wants them to love and, forget, and correct themselves and forget about their mistakes. So we're going to read Pope's The Rape of the Lock as a good example of a Horatian satire. Now let's just move on and look at Juvenalian satire. Juvenalian satire. Okay? Juvena Juvenalian satire evokes content. It is the opposite of Horatian satire. It evokes content. Moral indignation from the reader. Juvenalian satire aims to evoke contempt and moral indignation, anger. Indignation means anger. Where you see the word indignation? Okay, meaning that the narrator is intolerant. The narrator is harsh. It's not mild at all. It's not soft on the target. The narrator is not soft on the target. The narrator is harsh on the target. The narrator lacks mercy. Does not spare the victim of this satire. Because it's harsh on them. It shows contempt on them. It's intolerant of their witnesses. And so this satire is harsh on the target. You are so uncomfortable if juvenile satire reaches you. So that is the main difference between Horatian satire and Juvenalian satire. A good example of Juvenalian satire is a good example of Juvenalian satire is Samuel Johnson's London. Samuel Johnson's London. It's a point. It's a point. London by Samuel Johnson. Right? Another good example of Juvenalian satire is The Vanity of Human Wishes. Still by Samuel Johnson. The Vanity of Human Wishes. Let us look at indirect satire. So in the course of read, in the course of the course, we will read, we would like to read um, Alexander Pope's essay on man as a juvenile and satire. In the course of the course. Okay. Then we have indirect satire. Indirect satire. Indirect satire is where characters in a work 
put themselves in ridiculous situations that cause the reader to laugh at them. So here we don't use I. We don't use because it's not direct address to the audience. But characters are put in a situation where they make a fool of themselves. They make a fool of themselves. Right? Then we laugh at them. So the characters are put in a situation, a ridiculous situation that causes the reader to laugh at their foibles, their mistakes, and their ignorance, and their nonsense behavior. So you need to understand that satire was not always harmless as it is today. Satire, in the days of old, could be dangerous. In the sense that they were magically worded. They were what? Magically worded. Right? Like a spell. So that when such a satire is cast on the individual, the individual will go home and commit suicide. That. Because you not stand the hurt of the world. Making us to understand that words are very powerful and can hurt so badly sometimes. So that's the weapon. So even today, presidents, governors, uh, important people on the side don't like to be satirized. Don't want to be that louder. Okay? But well, that's what most of you do all the time. Okay? We satirize our president. We satirize, uh, satirize uh, we satirize uh, this man that said Charlie Boy. A uh, 70 years old man. 70 years old man. Who, Right? So the right aside of Kubo and used his voice as means. Then <laughs> Tiakasam. You put such a rise, Amy Logan. Amy Logan. Right? Recruit 50 million youth. What they will eat? Gary. Eba, do do, right? So you should arrive our president, which is not good. So SATA continues to be a veritable weapon for social change and consciousness till today. But we need to study its beginnings in the 18th century, right? So if you go out there and do social media skits and people ask about what you're doing, you know. Is that what you're doing? So, a good type, um, one type of indirect satire is the manipian satire. The manipian satire. An example of an indirect satire is the manipian satire. So the Menippian satire is an example of indirect satire. It is named after Menippus. It's named after Menippus. Menippus. It's named after Menippus. It's Greek originator. It's Greek originator. The person who popularized it was called Menippus. So it's named after him. Named after Menippus, its Greek originator. Another name for Menippian satire is Baronian satire. Baronian satire. Baronian satire. 
Environment Center. Named after Varro. Named after Varro. Named after Varro. A Roman imitator. Named after Varro, a Roman imitator. That is, he imitated many poos. Okay? Of course, the two types of direct satire have their own originators. For instance, Horatian satire is named after Horace, named after Horace, named after Horace. Okay? It's a Roman originator. While Juvenalian satire is named after Juvenal. Juvenal. It's Roman originator. So you take note of those. So an example of many um, Manipian satire is Anatomy of Melancholy. It's Anatomy of Melancholy by Burton. On the course, we would like to read Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travel and a modest proposal as examples of Manipian satire. Okay, so this is where you have Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travel. You also have um, a modest proposal, right? So we read them as well as. Manipian satire. Yes, Manipian satire. So another thing that you need to note about Manipian satire is that it is usually written in prose. Usually written in prose. Manipian satire is usually written in prose. Manipian satire is written in prose. But it is interpolated with poetry. It's interpolated with what? Poetry. It's interpolated with poetry. Interpolated with poetry. Or interspaced with poetry. It's interspaced with poetry. So the character of the literature of the 18th century is that it uses satire to reflect the weaknesses of the people of the time. That is the character of the literature of the 18th century. The message of satire to reflect the weaknesses of the people of its time. The dominant, the dominant genre of literature of this time was poetry, followed by drama. Prose was still following behind. Prose was just beginning. Prose was just beginning. The dominant genre at this time was what? Poetry. Followed by what? Drama. By drama. Prose was just beginning at this time, the 18th century. Okay? Prose was still coming out.
And for poetry, what was written at this time was mock heroic epic. Please write it down. What was written at this time was what? Mock heroic epic. So what did I say was the title of poetry written at this time? Mock heroic epic. Okay, so let's talk about mock heroic epic before we bring the class to right? very soon. That's gonna be soon. Right? So mock heroic epic is also called mock epic for sure. So the the genre of poetry was in keeping with the belief of the 18th century English writers that the best poems were already written, the best literary works were already written by the ancients. And who are the ancients? The classical guys, right? Like uh, Homer and Virgil. I already written the best poems. So all we needed to do was to look up to them and copy them and model them, right, for you to write a great poem in your time, okay? And so in writing poetry, they looked at the genre of poetry that was practiced in the classical period. And one great um, genre of poetry practiced in the classical period was the epic, right? And the epic is a long narrative poem written in an elevated style and used to praise the heroic deeds. Its tone is serious and solemn. Its language is grand, its style is grand and grandiose. The language is refined with a serious poetic art, um, genre. Okay? Like uh, Homer's uh, Odyssey. Thomas Iliad and Virgil's in it. Okay? Serious poetic forms. But, so you see, the neoclassical writers did not only borrow this epic form, they modified it, they altered it to suit the circumstances of that milieu. Okay? That's what happened. In writing poetry, they looked to the ancient and borrowed the epic form, but they used it in a different way compared to the way the ancient used the epic. And the result was the monk epic. So the monk epic was not practiced in human history until the 18th century in English literature. So the mock epic is a modified version of the epic practiced in the classical period. So what happened here was that they used the form of the epic to treat trivial subject matter. The usual subject matter, which was war. The depiction of war and the racism that heroes or heroes. Even in the Renaissance, you, you could recall Milton's Paradise Lost. You could recall Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen. These were serious poems. Okay? But in the mock epic, it changed. Because the mock epic is a type of poetry which uses the form of the epic to treat on serious subject matter. The style of the epic to treat on serious subject matter. The mock epic is a type of poetry that makes use of the epic style and form but treats on serious subject matter. And, there's, and the result is what? Satire. Which is the dominant literary move of the 18th century. What is satire? Satire is the dominant literary move. 18th century. 
the, 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 the intention, what the writers of the 18th century wanted to do did not al allow them to use the epic in the way the classical guys and the Renaissance guys did. That's why they changed it, all right, to satire. Because if you use this, um, a serious poetic form that the epic to talk about trivial subject matter, the result is laughter. That's what we'll see when we want to read the rape of the law. Because it uses the form of the epic to talk about something so trivial as cutting off someone's lock of hair. It's like a storm in a teacup. It's like what? Storm in a teacup. A storm in a teacup. So what was the form of this poetry? The form of the, the form of the poetry was that it was written, it was written using mock heroic couplets. The mock epic was written using the mock heroic couplets. Heroic couplets. Mock heroic couplets. So this is the characteristics of the mock heroic couplet. In case someone asks you, what is a mock heroic couplet? In case someone asks, what is a mock heroic couplet? So that is the character of the mock heroic couplet. It is that it is written in iambic pentameter. It is a two-line stanza that rhymes and is written in iambic pentameter. A two-line stanza that rhymes and written in iambic pentameter. That is heroic couplet. Two-line stanza rhymes and is written in iambic pentameter. Two line stanza that rhymes and is written in iambic pentameter is the mock array carpet or the array carpet. Iambic means that the that the stress pattern in the poem is one unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. And pentameter means that that occurs five times per line of the poem. Iambic means that the stress pattern in the poem is one unstressed syllable followed by one stressed syllable. Pentameter means that this happens five times. Happens five times per line. That's pentameter. Okay? One, two, three, four, five. And the stress pattern is one unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. That's I am. Because it occurs five times, that makes it what? Pentameter. I am big pentameter. If it occurred four times, it would have been I am big tetrameter. If it occurred three times, it would have been I am big trimeter. If it occurred two times, it would have been I am big diameter. If it occurred one time, it would have been iambic monometer. That's how it works. That's how it works. Okay. So when we'll be studying the literature of this time, that's exactly what we will see. And so from next class when we meet, we'll start a discussion on restoration. Have a